I sat between my parents. Yes, I have both a father and a mother. I am one of the few, one of the elite, one of the elect. I was not blurted from a wall of gestation sacks. I am true-born, for my mother actually carried me to term, all that time being heavy, ripe, slow, vulnerable. Yet my family protected her in those days and nights of weakness, because we are better. We are the true power in this city, the most important city of all, the only one that counts. The Dark City of Cormora. We languish on our skimmer, hordes of dancing and cavorting slaves on the deck below us, their paltry activities meant to titillate, to entice, to excite. I am a youth, so usually they have my full attention. But not today. They are adding a slight blush to my mother's face, a tightening of my father's skin. Their suffering is sweet elixir to us. It is all for the show, of course so we arrive in fine fettle. But it all seems so banal to me right now. But nothing could excite me more than the spectacle we are about to witness. Nothing. The packs of venoms that guard our procession are thick around us like flies, darting in and out to confuse locking systems dazzle the eye. At no point is our vessel open for a clear shot. None. Our shielding would defray most assaults, as this is a conveyance, not a raiding ship. My father has entertained me so, with the tales of his exploits among the mewling denizens of real space. I ache to join him in his next foray. Yet tonight, we are to head to the next best thing. For tonight, we head to the arenas. My first time, despite being near Nine decades old. This is the first time I will be seen by the city, its luminaries. My father and mother's rivals. I must be mindful of myself. How I present. So I must contain my excitement. To our kind, all is drab, all is done. All is a copy of a copy of a copy. The curse of near immortality. The cost of unprecedented perception. We experience the universe in a way that none of the others could understand. They are lump and moronic things compared to our magnificence. So everything must be extreme. Art, dance, war, love, hate, all done to extremes, felt to extremes, that the other species would envy. If they were to fathom how shallow their existences were compared to us, they would understand why we see them as we do. As nothing. They are nothings. Hence we hunt them, slay them, capture them, and use them for entertainment. It is an honor they do not deserve, but at least they have a purpose to sustain us. That is all. And it is here, in the building we are approaching, that their ultimate expression of existence is enacted. For tonight, I am taken to the arenas, at long, long last. We approach, and our small armada of guard vessels peels off at the very last moment, when our vessel slips into the obsidian walls of the structure. We are far from safe, which is, if I am honest, part of the allure. No offer of safe passage is given, no guarantee of coming home alive. Our enemies could strike and there are plenty of those. Our friends could strike, for none are truly allied in the dark city of Cormora. Everyone in this arena is a threat to us, but not a large one. 
For my father is a legendary archon, Skari, and his glare alone is enough to stop most in their tracks. We process forward, incubi surround us. They have been paid enough to buy most empires. They will be loyal until the end of their contract only, but none others. Even my father's own Kabbalites, even they cannot be trusted. None can. For this is Cormora, where only the cunning and bold may survive. We come out of dark corridors into the glare of the arena, the blare of its crowds. Our box is high up, the better to witness the spectacle of the night. A huge arena of marbles and alabasters, columns and plinths, statuary and tapestries, so inspiring that they intoxicate the mind with their lines alone. Beauty as far as the eye can see. Beauty as a backdrop to terror. The crowds are our kind, the true blood, the true heart of darkness, the soul of the elder people unhindered and unhampered. We are life and love, death and hate. We are the ultimate expression of the universe, its ultimate creation. And tonight, we dine on the lesser races, not with our jowls and jaws, our teeth and taste buds, but with our eyes. We drink in the spectacle and allow it to refresh our very souls. The crowds go into paroxysms of screaming as it begins. The master of ceremonies witters on for a moment. I ignore his hyperbole as I take in the expanse before me below his floating disc where he prates. The arena has walls that float and move, readjusting and restructuring perpetually, a maze that eats its own exit, an open oubliette with an audience, for none of them escape. There is only one way out of this for any and all who tread the metaphorical sands of the arenas, the shielded dome prevents escape, slays those who do not mark the boundaries in their minds, for of course they also change. The shield fluctuating in power and size, as does everything else below us in the arena. A victim is placed. A floating sack drops it onto the floor like a mammalian offspring. Confused, covered in slime, the thing stands. It was fast, for one not Jukari. It is large and powerful, as it wipes the slick of the sack from its eyes and face. Tall, scarred, a veteran warrior of the Mon K. <laughs> but its movements show its lump and form more than its dimensions ever could. Fast, but crass, base and ungainly. I look forward to its death. Eli's ballerina prowls into the arena, her body creating longing within me. She has fire and power and grace, her every movement art, sublime. The being below is going to die, despite his size, his speed, his strength, his armor that covers most of his body, leaving only his head open, his sword that whirs and barks like the blades of the scorpions of our weak shadows, the craft wielders. It will not make contact with her alabaster skin. It will not save him. He is a dead man. And tonight, I am told, I shall see scores of such encounters. Packs of chimerae hunting human prey. Clawed fiends let loose on flocks of tiny blue tau. Greenskins literally skinned alive by pirouetting witches while they still thrash around never able to stop the slicing that takes their exteriors from them, slither by slither. I bask in the beauty and horror of the night. I look to my father. He now seems younger, more potent, more clear. His eyes dazzle as he watches on. My mother, her hair more fulsome, her lips more red as the night goes on. She is beauty personified but only when she has the shine of the arenas to support her considerable natural allures. But of course, she knows the ways. She was once one of the witches who would perform thus, before she claimed my father as much as he claimed her. The blood slicks the walls and sands of the arena, 
and I witness the butchery of a thousand slaves from a hundred realms and races and species. They are beautiful, these females of our kind, grace and wrath incarnate. And after their spectacle, I am sated. I am glutted. I have fodder for a million nights of lust and longing, visions of how we treat those beneath us. And it fills me up. I am whole again, for a while at least. I am whole again. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and features of the Warhammer 40k universe, the grim darkness of the far future. Where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, we shall be looking into one of the most vicious and deadly of all of the warriors of the setting. For today, we shall be discussing the horrors that prowl the arenas of Cormoran, the slicing blades that dance through the hordes of the lesser races and take a tithe of blood from all they pass. Yes. Today, we shall be discussing the witch cults of Cormoran, the dreaded Hecatarii of the Ducari, the Eladrith Aeneas, the Dark Eldar. Now, I have to admit to being slightly drained, and will be leaning on that old existing wisdom a bit today. A bit of fatigue from recent events, so I hope you will forgive me and know that this will not be the norm for the future. This week just got away from me, but I did not wish to leave the table bare on a Friday. And so, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote. Witch Cults of the Arenas The Witch Cults provide their fellow Cormorites with a feast of agonies that, for a while at least, keeps the blades of their kin from one another's throats. Each cult's arena is unique, every performance more violent and outlandish than the last. For these gladiatorial sisterhoods are locked in constant competition to offer up the greatest show for their hungry-eyed audience. Komora exists in a delicate but well-established balance. Its citizens would gladly stab each other in the back just for the look on their victim's face. For to witness another's anguish is the only way the Jukari have left to feed their withered souls. Yet for the ruling archons of Komora, to allow the natural bloodthirst of their kin to go unchecked would be to invite catastrophic civil war. Because of their kind's unending need to bathe in murderous sensations, the Drukari have evolved the Hecatari, known in common parlance as the Witch Cult. Each Witch Cult is a thousand-strong organization of gladiators that puts on frequent displays of the most incredible brutality not only for the edification of the masses, but also for their literal sustenance. Such is the scale of the carnage staged by these armies of warrior athletes that their audiences leave the arena with the glow of well-fed predators. In this way, the populace is kept from full-scale anarchy, at least those residents of Cormora wealthy enough to attend the witch cult's nightly performances. Each witch cult has its own arena, which is as much a display of their wealth and status as it is a stage for their spectacles of violence. Comparing architectural masterpieces such as the Crucible or Maoth Stair to the primitive amphitheaters of other civilizations would be much like placing a glittering palace next to a mud hut. Likewise, the Dukari athletes that perform within them make the most gifted human acrobat look like an uncorded ape by comparison. Each arena has its own deadly charms and challenges, from staples such as spinning blades and ravenous beasts, to gravity wells, kinetic inversion snares, or even more esoteric and inventive hazards. Each witch cult is constantly in competition to outdo its rivals, with the sheer scope and imagination of its gore-soaked games. Many performances spread into the audience in interesting and deadly ways, as excitement builds to fever pitch. 
Arterial spurts of blood rain down into the rapt crowd as battle takes place over their heads or even amidst their storms. The arenas crackle with tension, the viewers leaning forward in their seats with eyes wide and the leers of hungry predators etched upon their faces. Be they aerial ballets of bloodletting, zero-gravity mass murder, or carefully selected menageries on the prowl, all cult performances have one thing in common. The area is slick with blood and viscera by the show's conclusion. Most of the Hecatarii are female, for among the Ducari, it is they who are more often able to attain the pinnacle of poise and grace their craft demands. Male witches ensure their witch cult is never wanting for strong offspring, yet though they are valued, they rarely attain high rank. Certainly the succubi who rule over the witch cults are universally female. Most cults contain several succubi, each leading the witches of a particular circle, but a single succubus possessed of unmatched power and deadly grace typically reigns over them all. So it has been since the earliest days of the Dark City, and so shall it always be. Beyond the arena, almost every witch enjoys the patronage of a powerful archon, for there is much glory to be had for the founders of the feast. More than this, however, the witch cults are powerful allies. After all, each is comprised solely of trained killers who enjoy nothing more than to demonstrate their consummate skills in battle. This mutually agreeable arrangement ensures that the witch cults never run short of slaves and esoteric combat stimulants. A good patron is always generous, lest his stable of warrior athletes decide to bite the hand that feeds them. Meanwhile, the Archon gains the allegiance of an organization of exceptionally trained Hecatari to lend their blades to his raid upon real space. The witch cults take every chance they can to prove their martial skills superior to those of the lesser races, both within the arena and without. Though they profess nothing but contempt for the warrior castes of real space, the witches get an undeniable thrill out of matching themselves against any suitably impressive opponent. The trophy halls of a successful succubus will thus boast the heads of Adeptus Astartes champions, conquering orc war bosses and Tyranid Hive tyrants alike. There is much more to a witch cult than its arena. Below the elegant spires and weapon nodes of each cult's stronghold's exterior are academies and training complexes devoted to every aspect of the close quarters kill. Anti-gravity hemispheres and grueling living landscapes ensure that each witch is at the peak of physical fitness. Each cult keeps an extensive menagerie, restocked by its beastmasters with an endless supply of alien captives and dangerous species. Different witch cults practice their own specialities, endlessly discussed by the arena's crowd. The bladed hand, for instance, hones the art of the unarmed kill, though they are famous for blurring the lines, whilst the stilled heart specialize in the use of poisons, venoms, and paralytic elixirs. A witch cult will often stage real space raids purely at the behest of its succubus. These raids are not only to gather new fodder for the arenas, but also to provide a chance for the witches to test their skills against new opponents. A witch cult raid is considered high art by many Dukari, who will pay handsomely to fight alongside the masked gladiators, alien beasts and speeding aerial acrobatics that each succubus unleashes upon her prey. Other raids are quite literary performances in their own right. While the witch cult's raiders and venoms scream down into the foe's midst and force their desperate victims to fight for their lives, Cormorite pleasure barges drift high above. Aboard these craft, wealthy spectators will swill intoxicating nectars and offer sneers or applause as each bloody slaughter ebbs and flows. While bets are won or lost on the conduct of favored combatants, such spectacles are especially popular amongst the smirking ranks of the Trueborn, who become steadily more exhilarated and revitalized as they soak up their miasma of agony that rises from battle below. Yet for all their foppish hangers-on, witch cult raids are veritable blizzards of violence. They are direct and unstoppable strikes that, 
like the witches themselves, scorn the cumbersome protection of armor in favor of the safety the pure speed provides. Like a perfectly placed knife thrust to a heart, a raid by a witch cult is swift, deadly, and precise, capable of felling even the largest and most dangerous foes before they even realize they are under attack. Amid hurtling squadrons of reavers and hellions, swept over by the half-glimpsed shadows of razor-winged jet fighters and void-raven bombers, the witches leap and plunge into the midst of their enemies with joyous abandon, fighting amongst the piles of their mangled victims. Only when the foe's numbers become overwhelming, or there are no further enemies to face the fury of their knives, do the witches retreat as suddenly as they arrived, leaving absolute carnage in their wake. The Cult of Strife, Excellence Embodied The Witch Cult of Strife has become the most influential in Cormora, largely due to the sublime talents of her excellence, Lelis Hesperax. This cult has risen to the apex of power, not through treacherous politiquing, but through mastering the creed of speed over strength and elevating their blood sports to high art. Even outside of the Dark City, the cult of strife has become synonymous with flawless cruelty. The witches of this cult are master executioners all, dedicated to performing the art of the kill in all its forms. From subtle murders to orgiastic slaughters, no method of death is beyond these witches' grasp, and whilst raiding a real space, the techniques of the cult's victims are keenly observed. If one of the inferior races has devised a way of killing it shall soon be catalogued by the Cult of Strife, and, if suitably spectacular, may be adopted for use in the arenas. The Cult Arena's performances are more patronized than those of any other in Cormora, for each time they put their craft into practice, they display new styles of violence and expose their crowds to unique methods of bloodshed. Nobility from every fractal corner of the Dark City come to observe these performances, and to imbibe the exquisitely crafted suffering the cult of strife produces in their victims. Many cons pay handsomely to see famous cult of strife witches fight champions from other cults, lavishing ever more riches on the eventual winner. This constant inflow of wealth allows the cult of strife to maintain an unending supply of the best combat drugs available, which they use to further enhance their talents in the arena. The brutal reputation surrounding the cult breeds in its constituent witches an air of superiority that is pronounced even by the standards of the Rukari, and they take every opportunity to show that this pride is well deserved. Though the cult of strife boasts dozens of the best warrior athletes in the galaxy, it is their prima succubus, Leris Hesperax, who is the flawless diamond at the center of the crown. Her allure draws in hundreds of thousands of spectators every night, each of whom is prepared to pay a high price for the privilege of watching her perform. Night after night, Lairs dances her way through massed ranks of stim-enhanced orcs, gut-wrenching grotesques, disgraced archons, and more, the crowd roaring its approval as she gifts each victim the kiss of death with a contemptuous flick of her blades. Though the cult's other succubi model themselves on Lelith, none have achieved the same heights of infamy. Among Lelith's many admirers is Asdrubal Vect himself, and the cult of strife has long been affiliated with the cabal of the Black Heart to the mutual benefit of both. Whether this is a bond of reciprocal admiration or the wary respect of natural-born killers is immaterial, for the Alliance has proven as strong as steel, and strength is hard currency in the Dark City. Thanks to the unparalleled power and generosity of their patron, the cult of Strice Arena, the Crucibal, is the most lavishly appointed and spectacular in all of Cormora. From the expansive laser grid to its toroid Reaver Arena, to the black-veined living jade of its mighty galleries, the Crucibal is one of the Dark City's greatest spectacles, as Vect himself was once heard to say, Lelis Hesperax is the greatest treasure of the Dark City, and one does not display one's finest emerald amid squalor. The alliance between the Cabal of the Black Heart and the Cult of Strife 
brings constant benefit to both. Even the most impulsive and hot-tempered succubus must recognize that a challenge to the cult of strife is likely to incur the wrath of Asdrubal Vect himself. Equally, the cabal of the Black Heart basks nightly in the reflected glory of Lelith's sublime victories on the arena sands. This unique symbiosis is magnified a hundredfold on the battlefields of real space, where the followers of Lelith and Vect fight alongside one another with merciless synchronicity. The pitiless firepower of the Cabalites and the point-blank ferocity of the witches mesh to deadly effect. The gladiatrixes of the Cult of Strife weave sinuously through the covering fire of the Black Heart to fall upon the surviving foes in an orgy of bloodletting. Freed from the customary necessity of watching their supposed allies for signs of treachery, both Cormorite factions are able to fight at their full potential against their luckless prey. On those rare occasions that the Belladonna of the arena deigns to take to the field in person, the spectacle of this alliance at war is raised to the sublime. Such a raid occurs only rarely, for Lilith's first duty is to the baying crowds of the arenas. Yet when it does take place, the competition to join the raiding party is so fierce it has, on occasion, triggered full-blown into Cabalite wars. The Gorenval Raid One of the most infamous joint endeavors between the Cabal of the Black Heart and the witch cult of strife was the raid upon the world of Gorvenfal. The planet was a stronghold of the Alpha Legion, a heretic Astartes faction synonymous with the use of stealth and subterfuge. For decades, an Alpha Legion warlord by the name of Yagathra Vrax had operated out of a fortress in Gorvenfal's Black Mountains. A noted bladesman, he plagued surrounding systems with piratical raids evading the Imperium's clumsy reprisals with ease. Vrax, however, eventually overreached himself. Having discovered that the Cabal of the Black Heart planned to raid the Imperium factory world of Melidrantis, he elected to use the Ducari as pawns in his own schemes. Vrax concealed Alpha Legionaries on the planet's surface, ordering them to wait until the raid was well underway. At the battle's height, they struck catching both the Cabalites and the beleaguered Cadian foes by surprise and exacting a heavy toll upon them both. Vrax's forces escaped with a huge stockpile of weaponry and left the Black Heart to retreat empty-handed. Needless to say, such an insult could not be allowed to stand. Azrabal Vect spared no effort in tracking down this mysterious assailant and prepared an attack to make an example of them. This was not to be a slave raid, but a slaughter. It was at Vic's request that Lilith Hesperex herself joined the forces arrayed for the attack, for to her would fall the task of personally humbling Jagathra Vrax. The raid began at Vgorvenval's bloated sun rose red and bloody on the horizon. A swirling webway portal tore the skies above the Black Mountains. The Alpha Legionaries were caught completely by surprise. From the portal flew dozens of attack craft, falling like a rain of knives towards a squat immensity of the Alpha Legion stronghold where it nestled amidst the mountain peaks. By the time the Chaos air defenses cycled up and flak batteries began to pound, it was already too late. Sleek fighter craft streaked overhead, bombs and missiles silencing one quad gun after another and tearing rents in the fortress's armored hide. Through these gaps poured the Cabalites of the Black Heart and the Witches of the Cult of Strife, leaping straight from the decks of their raiders into the smoke-shrouded corridors of the fort. Towering traitors strode to meet them, with bolters blazing and blades bared. The Hectarii sprinted and leapt into their enemies' midst, cutting down the armored giants with no thought for their own horrific casualties. Cabalite warriors advanced in the Witches' wake, their gunfire, laying low those traitors who evaded the Gariatrix's blades. The surviving Alpha Legionnaires were finally surrounded in their primary arming chamber, massively outnumbered and outgunned. It was here that Hesperax met Vrax in single combat, mockingly offering the Chaos Lord and his followers their freedom should he defeat her. A lethal swordsman with demonic strength burning in his veins, 
Rax set upon his slender foe with his hell-forged broadsword. Hesperex met him with a single, simple knife in each hand, standing firm with a slight smile pulling at each corner of her perfect lips. The fight that followed was a storm of blades too fast for the eye to follow, and within moments, Rax's sword struck the floor, his severed hand still wrapped around its grip. Hesperax, bare flesh unmarred, but for the Chaos Lord's blood, did not stop there. Swiftly truncating his arms and legs to leave him roaring in helpless fury at her feet. Even as the Chaos Lord fell, her followers closed in once more. Only one Alpha Legionary left the fortress alive that day, and his limbless form howls its unimaginable agony above the onyx gate of Vex Palace to this day. Cult of the Cursed Blade Sisterhood of Traitors While Ordukari celebrates sins such as wrath, pride and malice, the Cult of the Cursed Blade revels in the practice of treachery. The witches in their ranks thrive in this culture of mistrust, growing strong in an environment where one's closest conspirators are also one's deadliest adversaries. In Komora, the term Cursed Blade does not refer to a physical weapon, but instead to an individual or organization that rebels against its masters. The cult of the Cursed Blade has earned its name many times over, so much so that even for a well-protected Archon to invite witches from this cult into his palace is tantamount to cutting his own throat. Treachery is held as the greatest of all virtues by the Cursed Blade, for by a process of hyper-accelerated natural selection, the witches of the cult ensure that only the strongest and most cunning within their ranks survive. Weapons that deceive and wrong-foot the foes are popular within their warrior cliques. Many a harmless-looking ornament worn by the witches contains a hidden snap sword, poison barb, or pair of flick blades. And it is common to see many razor flails wielded amongst their ranks. In the arena, a favoured performance of the cult is to feign an alliance with an unwitting alien combatant, giving the warrior hope that they may survive the brutal ordeal before cutting down their false ally when all other enemies are dead. The stronghold of this devious cult is known as the Nexus Arena and is far more deadly than its elegant architecture would suggest. Every curve and line contains sprung monofilament nets, venomous dart launchers, toxin-loaded syringe drills and a myriad of other lethal surprises. Nor is this cornucopia of misfortune confined to the arena floor, for these deadly booby traps are ever-shifting and as likely to spring up amidst the audience as to lacerate or impale the performers. This is merely part of the fun, of course, adding a delicious frisson of very real danger that many Dukari simply cannot resist. Since the opening of the Great Rift, the Cult of the Cursed Blade have launched multiple large-scale raids in the Imperium Nihilus, both individually and alongside the Cabal of the Black Heart. Whilst they have ravenously preyed upon Imperial worlds lying isolated within this nightmarish realm, they have also defended such planets from slavering demonic hordes and warbands of Chaos Space Marines, each time instilling a dim glimmer of hope in the beleaguered defenders, before snuffing out thoughts of salvation with their own merciless cruelty. Cult of the Red Grief the storm that brings death. Whether in the arena or on the battlefields of real space, the Cult of the Red Grief use their aerial expertise to swiftly butcher their enemies. Their aiding craft attack with such speed that they are almost impossible to hit, and racks of living bodies hooked upon their wings release contrails of blood to miss their maneuvers. All witch cults believe that the best defense is simply not to be there when the opponent's blade falls, but the Cult of the Red Grief takes this to extremes. Their raiding forces employ whole flotillas of raiders that fly in close formation towards a foe, escorted by ravers, venoms, and hellions. When the aerial formations close with the enemy, the witches bound and spring from raiders to jet bike to skyboard and back again with athletic precision dismounting and mounting so swiftly that the transports barely have to slow. Only the witches themselves ever deign to touch the ground, and even then, 
only to deliver the killing blow to enemies who are still trying to adjust to the fact that they are under attack. Even when they have become full-fledged members of the cult, many within the Red Grief still actively participate in the gang wars that rage through the skies of Cormora. For most cults and cabals, these unending skirmishes are merely a proving ground for new recruits. But the Red Grief view them as an almost meditative practice that they return to after completing a real space raid. Like a hunter sharpening their weapons after each kill, the Witches of the Red Grief continue to hone their skills by preying upon Cormorar's gangland underclass. The Red Grief's main arena, the Pit, is an especially unforgiving structure built into the peak of a towering spire. Its galleries are made from transparent crystal, revealing that the audience are suspended only moments from a sickening plunge to their deaths. The arena proper truly has no floor, just a yawning gulf prowled by drifting anti-grav platforms. Hellion jewels in the pit are particularly spectacular, as their skyboards trail lines of monofilament wire that unspool in increasingly complex ways around the arena's struts and spars. Aerialists who lose track of their opponent's moves inevitably end up flying at breakneck speeds into the deadly latest, whereupon the monofilaments slice through their boards, sever their legs from their torsos, or decapitate them outright. Such bouts are typically brief, but the promise of seeing limbless, still-living combatants tumbling to their deaths far below draws huge crowds to the pit, night after night. The Cult of the Seventh Woe Teachers of Despair a surge of pale flesh rushes across the battlefield as the cult of the Seventh Woe close upon their enemies. As the flood of witches leaps through the opposing battle line, they swipe and slash with practiced deafness, leaving a carpet of mutilated bodies that writhe in agony and cry out for death. The Seventh Woe, in the ancient myth of the Elder Eye, refers to the destruction of the maiden god Lilith's Hearthmoon, at the hands of Caleb mentioned Cain. The legend is synonymous with the end of innocence, a tenant that the cult of the Seventh Woe embraces wholeheartedly by teaching those born into their ranks to wield a blade before they can talk. Each of its members has been learning to fight and kill since infancy, and although a great many of the Seventh Woe's warriors defect from the oppressive and controlling weapons regime of their masters to join their Hellion gangs, those that remain are counted amongst the most deadly of all witches. These witches enact the philosophy of their cult on the battlefield through a fighting technique they called the Teaching of Despair. Pistols are fired at bone joints, and blade strikes aim to carve out ligaments and tendons. In this way, their enemies are left alive, but completely incapacitated, failing helplessly and in agony as the realization of their own dark fate crystallizes in their minds. Once the entire enemy force has been thus mutilated, the witches leisurely stalk the battleground, saving the screams of their opponents as they are pinned to the prowess of raiders. In the arenas, this fighting style is less showy than that of some other cults, whose beheadings and disembowelments coat the crowds in showers of viscera but discerning patrons appreciate the delectable suffering that is wrung from the ragdoll victims of the Seventh Woe Witches. Cult of the Blade Denied Fate's Empty Hand Even amongst the myriad horrors that grace the Dark City's arenas, there are few sights more unnerving than seeing the unarmed witches of the Cult of the Blade Denied pounce upon the enemy pry the weapons from their opponents' hands and viciously turn those tools of death upon their former wielders. The Blade Denied is an Eldar witch house that specializes in the art of using their foes' weapons against them. The irony of a warrior impaled upon their own blade, a sight particularly favored by this cult. A perennial display in the Blade Denied's Helix Arena is an unarmed witch, seemingly at the mercy of a heavily armed opponent and sometimes even tightly bound or blindfolded beforehand, slipping the noose and gradually turning the tables by systematically disarming, then stealing the weapons of her opponent before the showy and invariably messy finale. 
The tendency for using the enemy's strength against them is magnified wherever the cult of the blade denied mounts a real space raid. The cult deliberately puts itself at a disadvantage against its enemies, taking on superior numbers in heavily armed emplacements with little more than well-sharpened knives, haywire grenades, and the raiders and venoms that bear them planetside. When the killing begins, however, the witches will improvise, turning the technologies of their foes against them, crippling the largest of enemies with judiciously targeted haywire attacks, and digging out the fleshy bounty inside with the care of an epicure, savouring every nuance of his carefully prepared meal. In fact, stories of planetary defenders falling on their blades and killing their compatriots out of fear when a Dukari raid appears are often just accounts of the blade denied practicing their grim art. Cult of the Wrath Unbound Masters of the Killing Trance When the witches of the Wrath Unbound go to war, they do so in a state of consciousness altered beyond what combat drugs can achieve. They are practitioners of the Killing Trance, and through gruesome meditations, they set their minds to the sole task of butchery. The Killing Trance, known in the Eldari tongue as Careless Menaid, is seen as a double-edged sword by the Asuyani, a near-berserk state where allies are killed as often as enemies, and the tang of blood in the air is the only thing that matters. The Cult of the Wrath Unbound seek to harness this half-crazed state of mind to better become one with the kill. Led by the succubus Heisnamini Veilblood, the witches and beastmasters of this cult practice long and gory rituals before each performance or battle, gradually letting their intellect slip away and their hungry instincts take over. Slowly but surely, they become creatures of pure bloodlust. Their eyes roll back in their heads, and ancient litanies to Kayla Menchikain, the Eldari god of war, spell out of their painted lips. A witch in the grip of the Kalos Mayonid will not just kill her victims, but reduce them to bloody scraps of meat, laughing hideously all the while. Whilst the killing trance is upon them, the warriors of the Wrath Unbound are every bit as savage as the packs of Chimerae and Clawed Fiends that run with them on the hunt. When in the full grip of Kalos Mayonid, the witches of the cult enter a state of absolute euphoria, and are seemingly unaffected by injury or fatigue. As such, their raids gather more and more momentum as the slaughter increases and the witches slip further into their trance. An intended assault upon a single city can easily become an orgy of violence that consumes a continent or even an entire world. Cult of the Pain Eternal Hecates Iconoclasts in the name of the Dark Muse who they serve, the Cult of the Pain Eternal commits atrocities throughout great swathes of real space, defiling the shrines and holy sites the lesser races use to pray to their gods. In this way, the Cult spreads despair far beyond where its raiding fleets reeve. The Pain Eternal are exceptional in that they do not make regular appearances within the arenas of High Cormora. Instead, they are spacefaring cult that dock only once every few years in the Dark City. Unstinting in the service of the Dark Muse Hecate, Mother of Strife, the Pain Eternal exists to tear down and destroy everything that is holy to the lesser races of the galaxy. Acts of anarchy and despoilment are held as a kind of inverse worship for the Pain Eternal, for they believe in a higher reward than the adjuration of the crowd. The stagnant serenity of worship is a powerful goad to the pain eternal. Shrine worlds in particular are preferred targets. The Adept of Sororitas is well aware of the cult's agenda and has brought it to battle on countless war zones. Despite the best efforts of the Sisters of Battle, many a religious stronghold has found massed strike forces of witches descending without warning, hell bent on replacing the surety of faith with terror and doubt. The cisterns of Hecatrices that lead the pain eternal love nothing more than to snuff out the flame of hope wherever it can be found. 
taking pains to defile and destroy the saints and venerated nobility of those they see as beneath them. The detractors often say that the pain eternal wreaked their own brand of havoc for no greater reason than to prove that nothing is sacred. But the succubi who lead them to battle profess a far greater aim. Where the witches of the arenas fight to bleed away the lifeblood of mortals, the cult of the pain eternal wishes to bleed away the lifeblood of gods. End quote. Ah, the Eladrithenes, the Dark Elder, those horrors. And what could be more terrifying, more difficult to face, than a being that you cannot even see move? For like their harlequin cousins, the witches of the arena are the very pinnacle of the form, speed and accuracy, death incarnate. Perhaps not the equal of the incubi, but it will be a difficult toss-up really. For the incubi are more deadly to those marines or heavily armoured aspect warriors or orc bosses, the witch is far more effective against the lightly armoured Tau or the hordes of the guard. For theirs is a subtle knife, the swift blade. Now I have to admit to adoring these horrors. The figures are divine, the law tantalisingly terrifying. But it never ceases to amaze me how little the elder are feared. A dying race, perhaps for the craft-worlders, who have morality and restraint and wish to breed the good old-fashioned way, despite how rare that actually is. But the Dukari, the Eladrith in Nice, few of them are born naturally. A risk to the mother, a danger to the father. So hence only the most powerful and dangerous of all of the Eladrith in Nice take this road. Most do not breed at all, for they are self-centred to such an extent that they know that they are practically immortal and a mere sort of giving something back to their society or the universe entire would elicit scoffing at the very minimum. So numbers are kept up by huge walls of cloned Dark Eldar being blurted out into the universe. They could easily increase production if they so chose. Dying race indeed. But they do not because they do not see the worth in dominating a universe that is merely a garden for the growth of their entertainments. Nor do people really think about the way that the Dark Eldar put themselves at a disadvantage so often in their overwhelming hubris. For their tech is even more advanced than that of the craft world Eldar, so they are more than capable of producing armor that would be more secure and protective than space marine power armor. They could enhance their strength and speed to levels that would make them a match for custodies. But they do not. Effectively, the witches of the Lucari are so skilled, so egotistical, that they bound into the combats of the grim darkness, practically nude, and using weapons that are designed to be precise indeed, but are far from the most effective they could use. They cartwheel into melee with any and all, with such contempt that they do not bring the best weaponry they could, do not wear the best equipment they could. Do not fight like conquerors. They prance into melee as if it were a day on the catwalk. And yet, they still carve bloody channels through the ranks of the lesser races. Just think what the Eredith in Nice, the Dark Eldar, could do if they ever took the universe seriously. I have been Baltimore, your faithful servant. I hope you have enjoyed this brief introduction to the witch cults of Cormora. If so, then please do consider liking and subscribing. If you do, then hit the notifications button, as I would not want you to miss out. If you see the worth in what we are doing, then do also consider joining our Patreon, or giving the video a share if that is beyond your present scope. It would be a great boon. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo!